This whole concern that do artificial sweeteners cause insulin resistance? I will tell you this again, it is not so easy to just make that assumption because of some of the things that I talked about. For example, there's a thing called participation bias. Bias means you may see a finding in a study that it may not be real. In other words, you may have selected, and that's another epi term, epidemiological term, you may have selected for people without thinking about it. That is a big, big deal with artificial sweetener research. So the simplest and easiest way to do a artificial sweetener study is to say, okay, we're just gonna do what's called a cross-sectional study. Cross-section means you just take a one-time sample from a large population. You know, just get people on the street at random and say, okay, do you take artificial sweetener? Then you look at the ones that say yes and the ones that say no, I don't. There's no question if you do that kind of study. And there's been tons of those done. Another example, you look at this study and say, hmm, how solid is that in terms of those of us looking for proof that artificial sweeteners cause insulin resistance? So let's talk about the study. First of all, where did we find it? Journal of Family Medicine and Primary Care the official journal of the Academy of Family Physicians of India. Not a bad journal, but clearly, you know, not the New England Journal of Medicine, not one of the top five journals in the world. And if you have information that's both important and very, very solid, you're going to go for the best journal you can go for. But let's talk a little bit more about it. What's the title? Effect of Artificial Sweeteners on Insulin Resistance Among Type 2 Diabetes Patients. And let's go a little bit further into this study. Methodology. The authors performed a cross-sectional study. So again, very similar to the type of study we talked about before. It's not a randomized clinical trial. You're not taking a group, breaking it into two or more groups, randomizing groups to a study group and a placebo group. There's none of that. This is, again, just a cross-sectional study, similar to the type that we talked about before. You take a bunch of patients, you do a measurement on them, and you ask them if they were using artificial sweeteners. And again, these were patients that already had type 2 diabetes. This was in a hospital in central India. So all the diabetic patients were divided into two groups based on whether they use artificial sweeteners group A or group B. So again, now you've created a dichotomy. And the question is, how and where did you dichotomize that? You know, did you say, okay, one sweetener per day or X amount of milligrams of a sweetener? Which sweeteners did you look at? Again, some questions which I don't think are that critical, but again, questions which come up as you start to get a little bit deeper in terms of trying to analyze a study which says artificial sweetener causes insulin resistance. And as we said before, they looked only at diabetic. The home IR values in group A range from 0.9 to 24.33. The home IR values from group B were 0.12 to 10.83. So the patients in group A gave a history of using more artificial sweeteners. We're not really sure how clear that dichotomy was, as I mentioned before. Did have higher HOMA IRs. So you've heard me criticize this study a lot in terms of a lot of different areas. By the way, if you're wondering what an epidemiologist does, and if you're wondering what I did those years when I was at Hopkins, that's what epidemiologists do. They look at the pros and the cons, the strengths and the weaknesses of studies to see, okay, you know, how strong is this study? If you look at quote normal values for an IR value, HOMA IR less than three, moderate insulin resistance three to five, and severe insulin resistance five and above. The American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association have cautioned not to use artificial sweeteners in place of sugars to combat obesity, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. And they've done that based on studies like the one we talked about today. According to some studies, an important reason for development of diabetes is believed to be artificial sweeteners. I'm skeptical. In one study, people were given either sucralose or water and then subjected to a glucose tolerance test. Now that study, that's the one that I mentioned mentioned a couple of years ago that came out. That study to me gives me more pause for concern 
than any of the other studies I've seen. Those given sucralose had higher blood insulin levels. So you know what? As I mentioned, I'm a sweets addict. I have used a lot of artificial sweeteners in my life. You could say, well, Ford, you know, you're a critic of these studies. That's why you're criticizing. Well, it may be we all bring our biases to the table, but I can tell you, I still had some artificial sweeteners, some diet sodas in my pantry. When I read this study about sucralose, I went through the exercise of throwing those diet sodas away. Now, I'm an addict. I'm a strong addict in that space. You know, I keep going in and out, in and out. Most recently, yep, I'm a little bit distracted in terms of the programs here in lower Alabama, juggling that and the channel practice and the channel itself. And I'm back on my addiction. I fell off the wagon. I'm back drinking diet sodas. Has it caused me health problems? I think it might have. Has it caused my insulin resistance? No, it may have made it worse. It was not the primary cause. My primary causes are number one, I'm old. I'm 64 years old and it started happening in my mid to late fifties and I continue to work with it. Number two, what's my second biggest risk? Again, body fat. I keep a BMI in the low twenties. I have more body fat than I want to have. That's a constant battle. Number three, epigenetics. I was a 10 and a half pound baby. We used to to think when I was born 64 years ago that that was a fat, happy, healthy baby. Now we know every ounce over eight and a half pounds, you have increased that baby's risk for diabetes and prediabetes when they get older, when they get my age, is greatly increased. And so again, there's a lot of baby boomers out there like me who were a lot heavier than eight and a half pounds when they were born. There's another epigenetic thing that hasn't really been proven yet for humans, but we've seen it in laboratory animals where if the father is is obese at the time of fertilization, the next generation and the second generation after that, the risk for those generations to have prediabetes and diabetes is multiplied. And yes, my dad was obese when I was fertilized when I came to be. So I've got a lot of strikes against me. I'm not denying, I think artificial sweeteners have probably contributed a little bit, but nowhere near compared to my age, number one, some body fat, number two, and some significant epigenetics. A couple of more points. A similar study was done in 2011. They compared the development of type two diabetes with consumption of artificial sweeteners, beverages, sugar sweetened beverages. The increased intake of artificial sweetened beverages increased the incidence of type 2 diabetes, suggesting insulin resistance as the, well, obvious mechanism for type 2 diabetes. But again, suggesting some more smoke around this topic of artificial sweeteners and prediabetes. So at the end of the day, do I think that they cause it? Yes. But here's the question, how much and how big of a risk factor are they? We had the comment early on with Jason Fung's review of our statement that there's a significant increase in heart attack and stroke risk for folks that have artificial sweeteners or they use them. Again, like I said, I have no doubt there is some increased risk. I do doubt how much that risk plays into, into the picture compared to the far more common and far bigger risks that we see.